All right, good morning, and welcome to the Wisconsin Counties Association's educational webinar series on county board rules and conducting the county organizational meeting. I hope everyone had a great holiday season, and after a few week break, we are back at it with week three of our series, focusing on rules of decorum and procedural rules, which make up a significant portion of many counties board rules. I'm Sarah Diedrich Hasdorf, Director of Outreach and Member Engagement for WCA. I have the pleasure of kicking off today's webinar and introducing our presenter for the day. But before I do that, just a quick word, few words on how we're gonna conduct this morning's session. So Andy plans to speak for about 45 minutes or so, leaving plenty of time for questions. Uh, if you have a question though at any time, please type it either into the Q&A feature or the chat feature, which can be found on the bottom of your screen. Um, while we do intend to take uh, Q&A at the end of the, the presentation, uh, the last few weeks, um, Andy has been really good at, at watching and monitoring the Q&A and the chat and taking questions as we go along. So depending upon how this webinar goes and the amount of questions we have, uh, we may take questions throughout or we may take them at the end. So again, just please enter your question that you may have in either the chat or Q&A at any time. Also, as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and this webinar and the PowerPoint presentation, along with all the other weeks, um, will be posted on the WCA website. So at this time, I'm going to introduce our speaker for today, Andy Phillips. Andy, I'm sorry, I know you hate it when I do this, but we're going to go with the standard introduction today. Uh, so Andy is an attorney um, at the law firm of Von Briesen and Roper and also serves as general counsel to the Wisconsin Counties Association. Andy has dedicated his career to assisting counties with their most challenging legal problems. He brings innovative solutions to the organizational, operational, and personnel problems facing local governments. He's our go-to guy in all things related to county government operations, parliamentary procedure, rules of decorum, county board rules, you name it, we ask Andy. So again, Andy has been joining us uh, uh, thus far for the uh, webinar series. He will also be joining us next week as well. So at this time, Andy, thanks for joining us once again and take it away. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everybody. Happy New Year. We picked the coldest day of the year to talk about rules of decorum and procedural rules. How fun is this? Uh, as Sarah mentioned, this is part three of a four-part series dealing with the entire way that we as counties organize ourselves and govern ourselves. As much as there is one set of statutes dealing with county government, chapter 59, there are 72 different ways that counties organize themselves. And that's okay, that's fine. <clears throat> and I think the point I wanna really illustrate today is that today we're gonna get into concepts and rules and ideas and illustrations and tips and not laws, not statutes. Um, there is no right way, wrong way. You gotta find as a county, what works best for you. And so as we go through the presentation today, we're gonna to talk about how Robert's Rules addresses this concept of decorum. We're gonna focus in on this public comment period because a lot of the questions that I get and that the association gets relate to the various controls and limitations that you can put on a public comment period from a legal perspective and then just from a, a very practical perspective, what is it that we want to achieve in terms of maintaining order during a public comment period? And then we're going to hopefully come to a realization that if we have a set of board rules that supplement and enhance the very basic elements that are contained within Robert's rules, that those board rules can help set expectations for meetings and help run effective meetings. And then we're going to talk about some special considerations and issues. Um, as Sarah mentioned, feel free to drop thoughts and questions into chat or Q&A as I go along here. Um, because again, there might be experiences that you all have had in dealing with particular issues in the confines of a meeting that others might learn from. So feel free to drop those thoughts and suggestions right into the chat or Q&A function. We've seen a lot of this this year. I love this illustration. This is a school board meeting. Obviously, school boards have been at the forefront of dealing with a lot of very, very contentious issues over the course of the past year, whether it be masking, uh, mandates on vaccines, school closure, school opening, you name it. Um, and so I've actually talked with a lot of different school boards about the various things that they can do to try to bring order 
to a very, very tense situation dealing with these board meetings. What we want to do is avoid as counties having meetings that look something like this. It's entirely disruptive. We can't get our business done and the meetings go on forever and ever. At the same time, and I will tell you this, at the same time, we want to provide the public with an opportunity for meaningful input. Okay, so how do we balance that? How do we balance the need to have an orderly meeting with the need to provide the public with meaningful input? That's not easy. It's not easy to reach that balance. It takes some thought. It takes some, uh, it takes some discernment. And so you have to think about how we establish the parameters associated with things like public comment and public participation so that we provide meaningful input and at the same time maintain an orderly meeting. Again, this is where your board rules come into play and where your board rules can help. So let's start with these concepts from Robert's Rules of Order. Robert's Rules of Order does have some basic concepts related to rules of decorum or debate. And the whole purpose of having these within Robert's Rules is so that we have a deliberative assembly, okay, and Robert's Rules defines deliberative assembly as the body that is actually holding the meeting, and in our case, it would be a county board or county board committee. So these rules exist so that the deliberative assembly can get through their business in an orderly fashion. And so when we look at Robert's Rules and the Rules of Decorum, we have the first question about, well, are there any rules that relate to debating the question, somebody makes a motion, motion is seconded, sec the motion is repeated by the chair, it becomes the body's motion, and so the body is going to debate this motion. Some simple rules to keep in mind as it relates to debate on that motion. An individual's remarks must be relevant to the question that's before the deliberative assembly, before the board or committee. The speaker has to address his or her remarks to the chair, avoid directing comments directly to another supervisor or directly to a member of the public or directly to another official within county government. Direct the comments to the chair. Speak to the question at hand. Avoid injecting the personal tone in the debate. All right, and these seem rather commonsensical, but I will tell you I've seen situations where boards and committees have gone off track in terms of debating this question, where they've started having debates amongst two different supervisors or two different committee members. And that's not to happen. You're supposed to be debating the merits of the motion or the merits of the question before the body. And in the context of that debate, remarks are made through the chair of the committee or the chair of the county board. A member under Robert's rules has the right to speak twice to the same question. But remember that as long as somebody else wants to speak to the question, the chair ought not recognize the individual wishing to speak a second time until everybody who has a desire to speak to the question for the first time has the opportunity to speak. Then you can go back and call on somebody to speak a second time on the motion. Under Robert's rules, you can speak no longer than 10 minutes in total. The thing to remember is that Robert's rules have these rules on debating a question, but you can modify these within your county board rules. If you feel like members ought to have the right to speak three times on a particular motion or a particular topic or a motion in general, you can put that in your board rules and that's fine. Because remember the hierarchy, we talked about this in the context of the parliamentary procedure webinars we did last spring. And I think we've mentioned these concepts previously in the context of this four-part series, is that when we look at the hierarchy of the laws and rules that apply to counties and county boards, we've got federal law, state law, local ordinance, policy and procedure, and then Robert's Rules. And so Robert's Rules is the default for answering parliamentary questions, but Robert's Rules explicitly recognizes that you can modify Robert's Rules in the context of your own board rules, um, which could become an ordinance. And so it's important to remember that concept. I had a question here right off the bat as it relates to the duty of the chair of a committee or a board. This is from Joe in Kenosha County. Would you agree it's the responsibility or the role of the chair to enforce these rules? Would you agree it's not appropriate for the parliamentarian to affirmatively object to a potential violation of decorum rules 
but to reactively advise if the objection is raised? That's a great question because I know Joe's the corporation counsel in Kenosha County. And I know that many, if not all corporation counsel serve as parliamentarian for county board meetings. It is not the role of the parliamentarian to declare somebody out of order. It is not the role of the parliamentarian to actually make rulings on particular issues related to parliamentary procedure. It's not the role of the parliamentarian to ensure that decorum is maintained throughout the course of the meeting. It is the role of the chair in all three circumstances. Now, the chair has the ability to consult with the parliamentarian. The chair should consult with the parliamentarian. The chair should make sure that whatever he or she is doing is consistent with local rule, parliamentary procedure, state statute, federal law. Parliamentarian, parliamentarian gives that advice and then the chair makes those decisions. So I agree with you, Joe, that is a situation where it is the chair's responsibility. Addressing the chair, as I mentioned before, we address all of our remarks on a pending question or a motion through the chair. We don't address the body. We don't address the gallery where the press and the public are contained. And we certainly don't address the TV cameras that may be in the room. We do not address one another directly. If we have a question and we want more information from a particular supervisor, or we want more information from a county employee or official who's attending the meeting, we ask the chair to get that information for us because realistically the body is entitled to that additional information and it is the chair who maintains decorum through the meeting and it is the chair who's responsible for acting as the shepherd. I always talk about this concept is that the county board chair is the shepherd leading the group through the process of governance. And so the chair is the one who's responsible for getting that information to the body. Avoid use of members' names. And I've seen this, I mean, obviously in a committee setting, people use each other's names as, and that's fine. And Robert's Rules actually recognizes that committee meetings are not nearly as formal as the big meetings of a deliberative assembly or a board. But I have seen in county board meetings where in a very informal way, people will refer to one another by first name. There's nothing wrong with that, so to speak. I think that there is a level of colloquialness or familiarity um, and it's okay to, to have a conversation speaking in people's names, but let's remember why we're here at a county board meeting. I wanna talk about a county board meeting for a second. We're here to conduct the county's business. We are in charge of multi-million dollar budgets and we're making some real impactful decisions. And so I like to see a level of formality at a county board meeting. Does that mean that you have to reference somebody by their supervisory district, the supervisor from district 13? Uh, that's what they do in the house and the Senate at the federal level. That's what they do at the state level. I don't know that you have to get that formal, but would it be appropriate to refer to somebody as Supervisor Johnson or Supervisor Jones, um, I think that would be appropriate. I think that level of formality ought to be expected because we're dealing with some very, very heavy issues. And so I think that it's, uh, it would be good, if not codified in your rules, to have a custom of formality as it relates to county board proceedings. The presiding officer, this is in Robert's rule. So Robert's rule speaks to this concept of a presiding officer. In our circumstances, counties, that's the board chair or the committee chair. They speak of him or herself themselves in the third person. The chair rules this way. The chair does this. Again, it's that level of formality. And frankly, it's a custom issue. And so when we have a custom of speaking in a formal way, I think that just heightens the sensibilities within the room as to the importance of the business that's before the body. So I would really, really encourage folks to take a hard look at how you conduct business at the county board level and try to introduce elements of formality there. It, when I've seen it done, it works very, very well. And it actually um, encourages what I would view to be effective and efficient meetings. Duties of the chair. Everybody at this meeting, whether it be members of the deliberative assembly, the board or the committee, members of the public, other county employees or officers, everybody at the meeting has an obligation, not a choice, but an obligation to obey the chair, the presiding officer. The presiding officer, the chair, is in charge of the conduct of that meeting. If somebody is going to use parliamentary procedure as a sword rather than a shield, meaning that they are going to obstruct 
the way that the meeting is proceeding, it is the chair's responsibility to call that member out of order. The chair is responsible for enforcing the rules of debate, order, and decorum. Back to my point in response to Joe's question about who is responsible for this, it is the chair that is responsible for enforcing these rules. And then it's okay for the chair to provide reminders to the body. Take my example about use of members' names. If we have a, a particular supervisor who keeps calling Supervisor Smith Joe, and it would be, and we we want to elevate the formality. We want to create an, an environment and a custom of being formal at these meetings. It's okay for the chair to remind the body that when we address one another, we address one another by utilizing supervisor and then the supervisor's last name. I view the chair in the role as shepherd to make sure that the body is fully aware of what the body is doing. And that may take a little extra time, but it avoids confusion. Because when we have confusion, that leads to inefficiency and in longer running meetings. And so it's okay and very much preferred for the chair to provide commentary on exactly what the body is doing as it relates to a particular motion. For example, if somebody moves the previous question, we know that moving the previous question takes debate out. It means that the pending motion goes to a vote. Moving the previous question requires a two thirds vote. And so if somebody moves the previous question and that motion is seconded, the, the chair should say, okay, we have a motion to move the previous question. It's been seconded. We're going to proceed to a vote. We require a two thirds vote for passage of this motion. And what it means is that we are going to end debate on the particular question before this body. And we will move to a vote then on the pending motion. Is it everybody ready to proceed? A statement like that, will inform the body of exactly what they're voting for and again, avoid confusion. The chair has an obligation to recognize members, give them the opportunity to speak on the floor, ask for votes on each side and announce those results. And then it's the chair's responsibility to respond to these requests and points of order. There are, there are questions on parliamentary procedure, raising a point of parliamentary inquiry. There are points of privilege where an individual has a question. There are points of order as it relates to a particular agenda or a matter that the chair has ruled on. It is the chair's obligation to respond to all of those requests. Now here's where we get into an interesting situation because as a county board, we know that the county board chair is an elected supervisor from a particular district. We don't have somebody who's elected at large as chair of the county board. And so the question always comes up, should the county board chair relinquish his or her seat in order to participate in debate? And my answer is always, it depends. If the supervisor that is the board chair has a particular interest in an issue and is going to speak extensively on that issue, then I think it appropriate that the county board chair relinquish that seat for purposes of debate on the pending question. If, however, the pending question isn't one that is particularly, I don't wanna say, um, interesting. I want to say that the chair is not going to participate a lot in debate. I think the chair can still participate in debate saying a few words without having to relinquish the chair. What you want to avoid is the appearance of bias on the part of the chair, the appearance of impartiality. And so the easiest way to avoid the appearance of bias or impartiality is for the chair to relinquish the seat to the vice chair to allow the chair to participate in debate. But then again, if we did that on every question, we have the same problem with the vice chair. The vice chair is an elected supervisor from a district too. We are taking away that individual's right to represent the people who elected him or her to that seat. And so I think you've got to play this one by ear a little bit, even though Robert's rule says that if the chair is gonna participate in debate, that you have to, the chair has to relinquish the chair. I think we have to play that one by ear a bit. Committee debate. Typically, under Robert's rules, we need to have a motion on the floor that's been seconded, restated by the chair, then we have debate. Robert's rules recognizes that in a committee setting, which is a much smaller body, it's more informal, that it's okay to have a discussion about the item on the agenda and then have a motion. And let's face it, when we get to the committee level, not everything is fully baked. And what I mean by that is that not everything has been discussed. We don't know exactly what that motion ought to be. 
We don't know what a majority of the committee members are going to support or what we think a majority of the committee members are going to support on a particular topic. So it's okay to introduce a topic, have a discussion on that topic, and then ask for a motion. Again, this comes back to the importance of the committee chair role. And so the committee chair ought to take the temperature of the room and figure out exactly what type of discussion and debate merits going on without a formal motion before the committee. At some point, the chair may say, before we engage in further debate, let's have a motion because we're getting to the point now where we want to start thinking about how we're going to vote on something. Let's figure out what it is we're going to vote on and call for that motion. So again, committee chair takes the temperature of the room and figures that out. In the committee setting, the members may raise their hand instead of standing when seeking the floor. Standing is the recognized procedure under Robert's rules for asking for permission to address the floor. I know in almost all counties, you have a process where you either uh, hit a button and a light comes on or some other way that the chair recognizes you. At the committee level, it's a lot less formal, okay? You can stay seated uh, during debate. Robert's rules recognizes that. Um, as I said before, discussions permitted before a motion, and there is no limit on how many times an individual may speak to a motion subject to the rule of the chair. Again, the chair is there to make sure we have an efficient meeting. So now we get to this concept about public comment. Before we do that, though, let me just reiterate here that all of these rules contained within Robert's rules as, as we go down this list, you may think some of these things aren't gonna work in your county. And that's fine. What I would really, really recommend and suggest is that you address the things that aren't going to work in your county and put them in your board rules. Because remember, Robert's rules of order are the default. And so if an issue arises and somebody says, hey, wait a minute, members are only supposed to speak twice on the motion. Supervisor Smith over here is speaking for a third time. That's out of order. Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, I request that you call Supervisor Smith out of order. If you don't have a board rule on the books, that supervisor has a good point because Robert's rules are going to say only twice can somebody speak to a motion. So I would really suggest that you take a look at Robert's rules as the default and figure out do we wanna change the default? And if we do, put it in your board rules. So let's talk about public comment. Public comment raises some very particular concerns. And I started this presentation by saying, we're not gonna dive into the weeds on legal issues. Well, this is one area of the presentation where we have to get into the weeds on legal issues. Because whenever we are going to take action to restrict an individual's right to present his or her arguments to a governmental body, we are obviously implicating the Constitution. The First Amendment guarantees everybody freedom of speech. It's not unlimited, and we're going to talk about that, but understand that whenever we are adopting rules impacting an individual's right to seek redress before their government, they were implicating First Amendment rights, okay? So I say in here, yes, we have to be wary of the Constitution, but if we have local rules that provide a right to public comment, um, we have to be very careful about how we impact those rights. And frankly, when we look at the public comment period, understand that this is the biggest challenge to maintaining order within a governmental meeting, at least from what I've seen. For the most part, I've seen instances of unruly conduct at the board level between board members. But for the most part, where I see the biggest issues is when we have public comment that gets out of hand. And so we have to think about what rules do we want to place on public comment. I will note the first bullet point here. Just understand too, and this is a misconception, there is no right to have public comment on a county board agenda. There's no statute that requires it. The constitution does not require it. So you are well within your rights as a county to say we are not going to have public comment at a county board meeting. But as soon as you allow it, as soon as you have it in your board rules, as soon as you have it in your ordinances, you have to be very careful about the rules and limitations you place on that right. So let's talk briefly about the constitutional considerations. County board and committee meetings are considered limited public forums. Here's the way I think about it. There are basically three levels of forums as it relates to 
the First Amendment analysis. We have the completely open public forum. That's the city park or the courthouse steps concepts that we see embodied within the law, where people have the right to go to the courthouse steps, the public park, and speak about whatever's on their mind. All right, those are open public forums. Limited public forums mean that we have an ability to control what it is the speaker is saying within limitations. Our courts have consistently recognized that when we're dealing with limited public forums, people do not have the same First Amendment rights that they do at open public forums. And then we have a concept of non-public forums or closed forums. And in that situation, you can absolutely regulate speech. So with county board and committee meetings, we're dealing with limited public forums, meaning we can regulate, but there are certain boundaries on the extent of our regulation. And those boundaries primarily relate to what it is the speaker is saying, okay? We can't regulate what it is the speaker is saying, but we can regulate the place, time, and manner of that person's speaking. What do we mean by that? Meaning that in a limited public forum, we can dictate where it is that the individual giving public comment is going to give that public comment. We can limit the amount of time that we are providing that speaker on a particular topic. And we can put in place certain manner restrictions related to avoiding use of obscenity, avoiding politically charged statements, things of that nature. So again, we can restrict. It has to be viewpoint neutral. It has to be based on place, time, and manner restrictions. <coughs> again, we can't discriminate on the basis of the message advocated. That's a very, very important rule. Just because we don't like what somebody is saying doesn't mean that we have the ability to regulate them saying it. So if a particular public commenter is opposed to a matter that the entire county board agrees with, we don't have the right to shut that speaker down. We have to listen to what that speaker has to say. But we can, as I said before, we can limit the amount of time that we give that speaker. So is the interest in an orderly meeting a legitimate government interest? The answer to that is yes. So you should not feel bad or ashamed or upset that you're placing these reasonable viewpoint neutral place, time and manner restrictions on the public comment period. That's expected. And that is a legitimate government interest in promoting an efficient meeting environment. Whittaker case Steinberg versus Chesterfield County Planning Commission or City Planning Commission. And I, I cite this not necessarily because you need to know the case. Um, it's from the Fourth Circuit out east. But I thought it was great in terms of the way that the court addressed a county board's ability to place restrictions on a public comment period. The court said imposing restrictions to preserve civility and decorum are necessary to further the board's purpose of conducting public business. And in this circumstance, the court upheld the validity of a rule requiring a speaker during public comment to address only items germane to the agenda. And I have this conversation with counties all the time. If you're going to allow public comment, does it make sense to have a rule on the books that says the public commenter has to confine his or her remarks to items that are on the agenda? I think that type of a rule makes perfect sense. Now, others may disagree with me and others may say, we wanna hear from the public on all sorts of issues and that's okay. But understand that in, in that circumstances, you're opening the door wide open and it becomes much more difficult to try to regulate a particular person's speech when you don't have a rule on the book saying that you only have you can only address items that are germane to the agenda before the county board. And so you have to think about what it is that you are establishing in establishing a rule on public comment. If you wanna maintain a very narrow focus on the comments that are coming in, then by all means have a rule on the books that says that a public comment has to be germane to the agenda. If you wanna open it wide open to any issue that the commenter, the public commenter wants to speak about, then you don't have that type of rule on the books. What about obscenities or disruptive speech? This is where we get into a bit of a gray area. And I like the last bullet point on the slide. Can obscenity be defined by the board or committee chair or should you define it in the board rules? I will tell you right now that our United States Supreme Court has struggled mightily with defining what is or is not obscene. 
And so if the Supreme Court can't figure it out, how in the world are we supposed to figure it out? Because the consequences are severe. If we define it in a way such that we exclude speech that would otherwise be permissible under the First Amendment, and that's what a court finds, we're on the hook for damages there. So we have to be very careful about how we define obscenity. At the same time, how do we define profanity? And is there a way that we define profanity in a way so that we may ensure that the commenter is utilizing a respectful tone and is otherwise contributing to a culture and an environment of civility at the board level? Sure we can. Are we better off putting these concepts into our board rules? Absolutely. And so in this last bullet point, I say, can a board or committee chair define this? Maybe, but I would much rather see definitions and concepts contained within board rules because the more that we can codify what our, what our expectations are serves two purposes. Number one is the defense for us in a court proceeding. And hopefully you've had corporation counsel review what it is you're putting into your board rules in terms of defining profanity and obscenity. So from a legal basis, we can tell the court, this is our policy and it's been our policy for many years. But second and equally important in my mind is it establishes expectations for the public. We tell everybody in advance, here are our board rules as it relates to the public comment period. If you don't confine yourself to these board rules, we are going to call you out of order. So don't be surprised if you get up during public comment and start spewing obscenities and spewing profanities that we call you out of order. And if you continue, we're gonna ask you to leave the meeting because it's right here codified within our board rules. And so I would highly encourage you that if you're going to place boundaries and rules on public comment, that you address these concepts of order, concepts of profanity, concepts of obscenity, and otherwise reinforce the fact that you're going to promote a culture of civility within your board meeting. Time limits, time limits have been upheld. We've got another case here out of the 10th circuit. It's entirely permissible within this whole concept of imposing reasonable time, place and manner restrictions on speech. Again, we're dealing with a limited public forum to impose time limits on a speaker. When can time limits be imposed? The best opportunity is within your board rules to establish hard and fast time limits. It's probably okay for the chair to announce at the beginning of the meeting or at the beginning of public comment, there, there are going to be time restrictions on the public comment period. You announce those and then you enforce those throughout, but you can't enforce an arbitrary time limit right when somebody is speaking, okay? That's number one, not fair. Number two, I fear the constitutional implications of such an imposition. So I think that this is another opportunity to address within our board rules, what time limits are going to prevail during the public comment period. What about people who don't speak? They're not up at public comment, but they show up at a meeting with a banner or a poster or a t-shirt, something like this. And then we'd start getting into a very complicated issue because can somebody exercise their First Amendment rights by wearing a t-shirt? Absolutely, absolutely. That t-shirt may depict an image, it may contain a slogan, it may have a phrase, it may do something that is an expression that is protected by the First Amendment. And so when we have people sitting in a meeting, holding this banner, holding a sign, wearing a t-shirt, and we wanna take action as it relates to eliminating a disruption caused by that banner, that poster, or that t-shirt. We have to be careful about how we do so. We have to be careful, but understand that the same principles that relate to regulation of speech in the context of the public comment period, the, all of those concepts apply here, okay? So it's, again, our rules have to promote a legitimate government interest, i.e. to have an efficient, and to have a, 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 um, a, uh, um, a, a good public meeting, an efficient public meeting where the rules of decorum are followed, that's our legitimate government interest. And we have to be content neutral. Again, just because we don't agree with what the t-shirt says or what the sign says, 
doesn't mean we have the ability to regulate it, okay? So again, when we talk about this concept of regulating signs, t-shirts, banners, posters at meetings, it would be great to have a board rule on the books that speaks to this concept of disruption. What is going to impede the efficient progress of a meeting? What is going to cause a disruption? Work with Corporation Council on that rule. Because again, we're dealing with constitutional issues and that can get very, very tricky. But establishing these parameters up front serve the dual purpose again. Number one, it provides a defense in the unfortunate event you're ever sued on this. But number two, it establishes expectations for the public. The public ought to know that we are going to have an efficient meeting and an effective meeting. We're going to get the county's business done. We're not gonna stand for disruptions during that meeting. And if you wear t-shirts or hold banners or posters that contain obscenities or profanities, we are going to take you out of the meeting. We're going to excuse you from the meeting. Here's an example of a rule that's been upheld with it by a court. I wanted to put this here just so you can see how difficult it may be to really fashion this rule when you start thinking about it, because there are all sorts of concepts contained within this rule. This rule says it shall be unlawful for any person in the audience at a council meeting to do any of the following. One, engage in disorderly, disruptive, disturbing, delaying, or boisterous conduct, such as, but not limited to, hand clamping, stomping of feet, whistling, making noise, use of profane language or obscene gestures, yelling or similar demonstrations, which conduct substantially interrupts, delays, or disturbs the peace and good order of the proceedings of the council. And I have little parentheses at the bottom here, but notice the room for interpretation within this rule. I mean, even when we have a rule on the books, we still have a lot of room for interpretation. What is really going to, who defines what substantially interrupts, delays, or disturbs the peace and good order of the proceedings. I mean, that's really tough. And so I do not envy the role of the board chair or the role of the committee chair as it relates to enforcing a rule like this. But I will tell you right now, having a rule like this on the books is much better than the alternative, which is having no rule at all. Because then what do you have in terms of your ability to maintain peace and good order of your county board proceedings? You got nothing. And so you're falling back on Robert's rules local customs, and the statutory or ordinance definition of disorderly conduct. That's a really difficult place to be too. So even though there are, and I wouldn't call them necessarily ambiguities, I would call them challenges to defining some of the terms contained within a rule like this, I still think it's great to have a rule like this on the books. And I think you ought to talk about a rule like this on your books just to have there to fall back on. Now let's talk a little bit about special considerations and issues. And this is just, you know, basically, uh, this is a question that came up after our first, first uh, webinar in this series about what do you do if you get to a meeting and there's no quorum? Um, because I think people are concerned about not only the Roberts rules implications, if you get to a meeting and there's not a quorum present in order to conduct business, but also the open meetings law implications associated with this. And you talk to any corporation council and they're gonna to talk to you consistently about open meetings law considerations in this circumstance. Because remember, open meetings law takes precedence over Robert's rules. So just because Robert's rules has a process for dealing with a lack of quorum doesn't mean that that process necessarily complies with the open meetings law. So Robert's rules would allow, for example, for a meeting to continue for discussion purposes with no official action taken so the members can discuss items that would have been on the agenda. How does the open meetings law view that? That's a big problem. That's a huge issue, all right? So again, be mindful of these open meetings law considerations. Just because you don't have a quorum doesn't mean you do not have a negative quorum or a walking quorum. And we both know that those issues, the negative quorum and the walking quorum, are big issues under the open meetings law. And so from my perspective, and again, you wanna consult with corporation counsel, from my perspective, if you get to a meeting and you don't have a quorum of the board or a quorum of the committee present, call the meeting to order at the appointed time, 
Note for the record that we did not have sufficient members in order to maintain a quorum for the meeting and then leave, then you're done. Don't discuss county business. Don't discuss items on the agenda. Don't discuss anything else, leave. You can speak to, should we schedule a meeting and when? You can say, we're gonna reschedule this meeting for Friday at one o'clock, that's okay. But you do not have any discussion about the merits of what the agenda contained or what's before the board or committee when you don't have a quorum. That's the only way and the best way to avoid implications under the open meetings law. So with that, we're through the formal presentation as it relates to rules of decorum, public comment period, and things of that nature. Um, the takeaway, the big takeaway today is hopefully to plant some seeds for ideas about how you can address these concepts within your board rules. What's gonna make sense in your county? What's gonna lead to that culture of professionalism, culture of efficiency, culture of formality, the way that we want to conduct business within our county? If there is a certain way you want business conducted and it's not being done, put it in your board rules. If your board rules are deficient right now as it relates to that culture, then address those deficiencies within your board rules. Now is the time that you have the opportunity to get that done. So with that, Sarah, I'll turn it back. I see we've got one chat comment real quick. Would you be able to email me the slides that were in this presentation? I believe, Sarah, that the slides are going to be available on the Counties Association website, wicounties.org. Is that right? That is correct. The slides and the uh, presentation will be on the WCA website under events and then past event materials. And that's where you will find the first two weeks recordings as well as the PowerPoint slides from the first two weeks. We'll get this week's up as, as soon as we can. Um, and then next week as well, we'll get, well that's where that next week's uh, presentation will be posted too. Other questions from the group. It seems that um, in this circumstance, Sarah, everybody is fully understanding exactly where we're going with this one. That's great. Uh, you just got another question, Andy. All right, here's the question. Isn't it true that written comments from the public could carry the same weight as public appearance? So even if not everyone gets to speak at a meeting, written comments could count and be submitted. Absolutely, you can always receive written comments from the public. And I often see on, on county board agendas, for example, correspondence and the chair will indicate what type of correspondence came in on a particular issue. And then that correspondence is distributed to the entire board. So you could always encourage written comments to come in that get distributed to the body as an alternative to public comment or in conjunction with public comment. That's perfectly acceptable. And Andy, just to look, I'm looking at that question a little more closely, and I'm wondering if you could address the issue of a county board rule that would say, you know, we will take public comment for 30 minutes and five minutes each, and say we have 10 people who are there. And so I think this question, you know, references if not everyone gets to speak at a meeting, can you cut off public comments after 30 minutes? And everyone else who was there and registered after 30 minutes, do you not allow them to speak? How do you handle that? I think in theory, you could do that. I think that's dangerous because at that point, you are picking and choosing winners, people who get to speak and people who don't get to speak. I would much rather prefer unlimited public comment in terms of the overall time period that it takes and impose time limitations on each speaker whether it be two minutes, three minutes, or whatever. Once you start eliminating an individual's right to speak, you are running into constitutional concerns. I'm not suggesting it's unconstitutional. I think there may be circumstances where such a rule would be appropriate, but I would much rather prefer to avoid those constitutional concerns altogether and limit the length of a particular speaker as opposed to limiting the length of the overall public comment period. Andy, there is a question under the Q&A. When's the proper time to create board rules? At the beginning of a chair's term in an exec committee? I mean, that's a great question. Sarah, you and I talked about this when we talked about this webinar series, is that in our minds, the existing county board, meaning the one that was elected back in 2020, has a good idea of how the county board is operating from a governance standpoint. And so this county board has a pretty good opportunity 
to either dust off existing board rules or create board rules from scratch. Once those board rules are either amended or created, the current board adopts them and sets expectations for the new board that's coming in. Because of course, within the board rules, you ought to address this concept of an organizational meeting that's gonna happen on the third Tuesday in April. And so you wanna make sure that these board rules are set by the time the new board comes in. Of course, there is nothing, nothing prohibiting a county board from being seated in April and as an item of business, looking at the board rules and making modifications. That's fine. But I think you and I both agree that looking at those issues now before the new board comes in makes a ton of sense. Do you agree? Yeah, I agree, Andy. The question too, I think that, that I think we get asked a lot is not necessarily who, you know, who creates the rules, because I absolutely agree, a brand new supervisor coming in probably want to have the expertise to be able to provide a lot of, of you know, uh, valuable input as to what the board rules may look like, just simply because they may not have been, you know, in regular attendance at county board meetings and understand how the meetings work. But the question is, can an old board adopt rules for the new board to follow? Or should the board rules always be adopted at the organizational meeting? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it depends on your county. I know a lot of counties have codified their board rules in ordinance, and that's something that we suggest to establish permanency to the board rules. And the reason that we want to establish permanency is to avoid what you just described. We have the end of the session, so to speak, the two-year session of the outgoing board. Do the board rules expire with the end of that session if they're not codified in ordinance? That's an open question. Um, and there's no real solid answer on that because we don't have guidance from statutes or elsewhere that tells us exactly when what an old board did expires. And so I think to avoid a situation like that, it would be good to codify those board rules within an ordinance to establish some permanency to those particular rules. Now, the opposite side of that, of course, is if you want, you could as a county at the organizational meeting or shortly thereafter, establish board, board rules that will prevail during the two-year term of the new board. You can do that. Just understand that those rules are going to expire after that two-year term, and you're going to have to start from scratch again come when the new board gets seated. So I think having some permanency to the ordinance and placing those board rules, permanency of the board rules by placing them in ordinance helps us out, creates continuity, creates expectations. And, and when I talk about expectations, what I would like to see is that the newly elected board members come in with an understanding of exactly how the county operates from a governance standpoint. And the way that that new board member gains that understanding is by have, having board rules published in an ordinance and distributing those board rules as part of the packet when individuals take out nomination papers. I just think setting expectations is really a critical part of this to lead to a, an effective and efficient meeting process. Other questions? Andy, I am not seeing anything coming in in the Q&A or in the chat. So as a reminder, as we give folks another moment or two, and I did see another question just pop up in, pop up in the chat, um, just as a reminder, next week, we won't be meeting on Monday. We know a number of counties are close for the MLK day. And so we will be getting together next Tuesday at nine, nine o'clock instead. So Andy, you see the next, last, next question on the chat. It's not a question. It is a, um, it's actually a very kind comment about me. And so I'm not going to repeat it. Otherwise I look like I'm completely self-serving except to say thank you for the, for the kind comment. That's good. Let me just plug WCA for a moment too, because Sarah and I have been on the circuit for many, many years talking to county boards about things like county board rules, rules of decorum and things like that. If you have a particular concern in your county, and I know that these are out there, you just can't seem to get a handle on the public comment period. You just can't seem to handle decorum at the county board level. Give the association a call. We'd be happy to have a discussion with your board leadership your corporation counsel, your administrator, administrator coordinator, your executive, others about how we can help to try to establish expectations at the board level, establish expectations with the public 
That's something we've worked on quite a bit because ultimately nothing is more frustrating to us than to see counties get mired in these debates and discussions about matters that don't relate to the very important business of county government. We want to get all of you back into the role that you were elected to serve, which is to represent your constituents in the really important stuff that counties do. So feel free to reach out to the association. And I just got it in the chat room. I can repeat the comment. Just as Andy's thorough and crystal clear in explanations, much appreciated. This provides a new candidate like me some comfort as to what to expect in county board meetings operationally. Along those lines, um, there may be opportunity as well for new boards and new board members to attend like county official workshop uh, trainings, the COWS trainings that Sarah puts on every two years. Um, I know I'm involved, Marco Collins involved, Kyle's involved. We all have conversations with different counties about, again, at the organizational meeting, establishing expectations. So again, if the association can be in a, a resource in, in that regard, feel free to reach out. We'd be happy to help. I was just going to say, Andy, you did it for me. I was just going to make a plug for our county officials workshops that we do in conjunction with uh, UW Madison's Division of Extension Local Government Education. Uh, their their new name is a mouthful, but uh, but yes, um, we just finalized the dates of those last week, and so we will be getting additional information out in the next few weeks to everybody as to how to access the county officials workshops. Um, we will be doing them in person this year. That is the goal. Last two years ago, we we had to do them all virtually but you will be getting the full day's worth of education uh, this coming spring. And we are going to do one virtually as well for those folks that are not comfortable or able to travel uh, to one of the county officials workshops, we will be doing them. Uh, we will be doing one session virtually too. We just had a comment posted talking about the difficult concepts that we've dealt with the last 18 months. On top of all of the COVID stuff that we've been dealing with, We've been dealing with concepts like um, voting rights, concepts like the Second Amendment, and other issues like that. Um, I know that those are challenging, and I know that those are tough, and I know that you have particular interests within your electorate that want to press these issues. And so again, the more that you can try to create boundaries for how it is we're going to allow people to express themselves at our county board meetings, at our committee meetings, the better off you're going to be getting back to the really important business that counties have to do. So I think, again, establishing those boundaries is going to be critical. I will say too that as it relates to all of the things that I've been talking about today, we still have some counties that are very comfortable in a virtual world whether it's a meeting or a board meeting virtually, a committee meeting or a board meeting virtually, by Zoom, for example. We've become comfortable with this. All of the same rules that I've been talking about apply to a Zoom conference. So if we are going to establish parameters for public comment, we're going to apply those parameters in the context of a Zoom as well. So just understand that these rules, these concepts, these ideas apply across all platforms, in-person meeting, video meeting, telephonic meeting, whatever. Keep that in mind. Another comment maybe to cover later, county supervisor is a nonpartisan position. All the issues can and should be regarded as nonpartisan. Don't get pulled down the rabbit hole of futile and endless political arguments. Great point. I, I couldn't agree more. That's the one thing that, it's not the one thing, but it's one of the primary things that I really enjoy about working with counties on is the fact that we don't get drugged down into the politics of the day at the state or federal level, that what we are doing is serving our constituents and doing some really important stuff on behalf of our constituents as counties. And so I love the fact that we don't get mired in all of those politics. It's not to say that politics at the local level aren't just as ugly at times as they are at the state and federal level. In fact, I have several friends who, when they complain about politics at the state and federal level, I say, you ain't seen nothing until you've seen local politics. Because there, it's not R and D that we're concerned about, it's which side of the issue are, are you on. But at least in that circumstance, we're dealing with the issues and not partisan politics. 
So I'll get off my soapbox for a moment, Sarah. All right. We'll give you a soapbox every once in a while, Andy. Um, so I think I'm not seeing anything else in the chat or in the Q&A. So I want to thank everybody for joining us for week three of this educational webinar series and hope to see all of you again next week, again on Tuesday, January 18th at 9 a.m., where Andy Phillips will be with us once again to talk about conducting the county organizational meeting. So again, thank you for your uh, participation today. We look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great week. Thank you, everybody.